Welcome back to the fifth lecture series on finite element method theory and implementation. And firstly, I want to thank all of you for attending these lectures. So I've seen that so many clicks are on the videos, so it's great that the attendance is actually that high. And well, after having talked about the introductory topics for finite elements when defining a grid and then uh, deriving the concept of weak derivatives in the last lecture. Today we want to go one step further and we want to uh, go from the weak derivatives to weak solutions, so that's something slightly different, and then to local polynomial spaces, so to the definition of the actual discrete spaces that will in the end uh, be our linear system. And as the topic of this talk, I have uh, denoted the phrase, what if we want it linear? And you can see already here that uh, I'm referring to the polynomials, but also I'm referring to the motivation of this talk. So the motivation of today's lecture will be the story of the constant zero, and this is closely related to linear or more precisely piecewise linear functions. And we will see that although they are great at approximating stuff, they can be a big drawback when it comes to actually checking for the correctness of a solution. And they are our motivation to define the concept of weak formulations. So the next big topic of today is PDEs in weak formulations. For that, we will give a short recap on Sobolev spaces. So how were those weak derivatives defined? And then we will derive the weak formulation for our Poisson problem together. And we will discuss the further steps that we need towards a finite element method. So what's next to do? And then as promised, uh, what if we wanted linear? The topic of local polynomial spaces. <clears throat> so we will start by talking about basis representations, Lagrangian conditions and uniqueness of basis in general. And then we will start defining the linear and quadratic basis functions on our triangle cells. And I will give a short outlook on higher orders and um, yeah, what we can do there. So as I've promised, our motivation will be the story of the constant zero. And for that, we start with a little reminder of what we talked about when we discussed the finite difference method. I said already then that the finite difference method in a nutshell contains all the problems that we have when talking about finite elements too. And that is the case also here because um, we will see right now that one of the major problems that occurs when talking about finite difference methods will also be a problem for us in the FEM. So, where have we started? We have started with this Poisson equation, so minus Laplacian of u equals f in our domain. The motivation was this uh, trampoline, so the membrane bending thing. And then we had those uh, homogeneous Dirichlet boundary conditions, so u, u equals zero on the domain boundary. And the next step from there was to uh, define computational grid, or more particularly in that case, um, set of points. And from those points, we tried to approximate our derivative by introducing this five-point stencil. So using the uh, forward and backward difference uh, formulas, we have approximated this Laplacian of U. And this gave us a linear system that looked kind of like this. So 1 over h squared, some matrix with those uh, one, minus 1 and 4 entries. Then times u, the dot vector containing the solutions, components. And then the right-hand side f from the external force. And having solved this linear system, the result was a dot vector, so a vector of values for each point in the computational grid. 
So in that case that you see here, u would be a vector with 16 components and each component would reflect the value at a corresponding point in the grid. And then in order to visualize our results, we have um, used the plot surface function in Python. And what plot surface is implicitly doing is that it uh, draws all those points and does a linear interpolation, a piecewise linear interpolation uh, between all those points. So it draws the points and then it uh, takes um, a linear or, yeah, actually more or less bilinear because it is related to uh, rectangular cells and then it draws this, this solution. Okay, so we had our points that were the coefficients or the values at the, uh, yeah, or we had the dot vector with the coefficients at certain points and then we have done this piecewise linear approximation um, of the whole solution. And you see here, if you summarize those two parts, that on the left-hand side where you started was a second-order partial differential equation, and on the right-hand side, a piecewise linear function. And this will also be a common case in the FEM, so the finite element method that we will be implementing in this lecture will also be a linear FEM, so we will uh, define piecewise linear spaces as the solution space, and that is not a strong restriction, so that's also in practical applications a quite common thing to do. So when talking about standard PDE problems, it's very common to use linear FEM. But if you see on the left side the second order PDE and on the right side this piecewise linear function, you can already guess that this might cause some problems. Well, what problems are there? Well, the first one is, of course, um, piecewise functions are not actually differentiable, but we have tackled this problem in the last lecture by introducing those weak derivatives, which essentially said that as long as something is piecewise differentiable, it's also differentiable in a weak sense by using these integrals where the um, non-differentiable parts don't really matter. So in our case, these edges between the individual cells where the function is not differentiable. They are sets of measure zero, so they don't matter in the end. So that's fine. So we've introduced this concept of weak derivatives to be able or to be allowed to compute the derivative of uh. And then what else have we learned? Well, we have learned when talking about weak derivatives that if we have a piecewise differentiable function, then our gradient is also the piecewise gradient. So you just, in this case, take the gradient of the function on each cell of the grid individually. Okay, and then we have a problem. Because although we are allowed to differentiate uh, we see that on every individual cell, uh is linear, because globally it's piecewise linear. So forming the gradient of this um, linear function on a certain cell gives us a constant gradient because that's what linears do. And then if you form the Laplacian, so the second derivative of a linear function, you simply get the constant zero. So even though our weak derivatives allow us to differentiate uh and the weak Laplacian um, is well defined, it doesn't really help us because it's simply the constant zero. And that kind of sucks because uh, we can never simply plug in our numerical solution, our piecewise linear function, and check if it's uh, or how well it solves the PDE. Of course, there are other ways to check if something works. But, well, what's the easiest thing that you would do if you compute an approximation for this thing here? Well, you plug it in and then you see, well, if I take the Laplacian of uh, is that approximately my right-hand side or is it not? So that would be the easiest check to do. But you simply can't do that because the Laplacian of uh is zero, 
and unless f is also the constant zero, it will definitely not be a good approximation. Okay, so we've seen here that uh, although piecewise linear approximations for certain problems are quite common and also, as I've promised you, a good thing in a sense, they bring problems in terms of plugging the solution into the original partial differential equation. And well, even though um, we might consider changing our uh, approach of constructing the, the numerical solution, so you might say, well, we could also take piecewise quadratic or piecewise cubic functions or something. Yes, that's one way to go. But because the linear functions are so simple and so elegant, we don't want to simply exclude them. So instead of choosing a different approach for the numerical approximation, we are going for a reformulation of the problem. All right, now let's get our PDE in a weak formulation. So as already promised, we will take our original problem and transform it into something else that is more suited for us. And firstly, a short recap of the last lecture on Sobolev spaces. Um, what are the defined things that we need? The space L2 is the space of square integrable functions. So all those functions defined on our domain omega such that the squared value can be integrated over the domain and doesn't uh, or is less than infinity. Okay. Then we have defined this concept of weak derivatives because we have observed that if we have a certain function then we can apply the partial integration theorem and so if for our function f we have a function g such that uh, we can shift the derivative from the test function to the function g, um, then g can be called the derivative of f, the weak derivative. And then with this we have defined the Sobolev space of order 1, uh, in particular this h1 space, it was regarding the uh, square integrability. We've also said that there are other Sobolev spaces that don't care about L2 but maybe about L1 or L3 or something else. But here we're talking about H1, so that's the space of all square integrable functions such that the weak gradient is also square integrable. Okay, so U in L2 such that the gradient of U is also in L2. And then we have seen that we can also equip those uh, Sobolev spaces easily with boundary conditions and say that H10 is the space of all H1 functions such that they vanish on the boundary. Or if we have a more complex boundary that is made up by a Dirichlet part where we uh, define the function values and a Neumann boundary part where we do something with the derivatives, then we can say that the uh, h1gd space, so the space of h1 functions such that they equal the function g on our um, gamma d, so on the Dirichlet part of the boundary. So that was for the problem, for example, minus Laplacian of u equals f in omega. And then uh, we had a Dirichlet boundary condition on gamma d. And then we had a uh, Neumann boundary condition, uh, for example, gradient of u point n equals h on the gamma n. That was, uh, for example, the case in this heat transfer example that I have shown at some point, um, where we had a constant heat source on one side, which is a Dirichlet boundary condition and just an insulate an isolation on all other parts of the boundary, which is a homogeneous Neumann boundary condition. So H equals zero. Okay, so that's what we have so far. And then we want to derive a weaker formulation. And firstly, let's let's try to summarize what the problem is actually is. 
Well, firstly, for the, as I've already said, very common piecewise linear approximation, it's difficult to compute errors because we cannot simply plug the numerical solution in the PDE and see what happens. Because if we plug it in there, it's, uh, yeah, it's simply a constant zero because the Laplacian of a linear function is zero. And then also it doesn't really add up because we, uh, we are allowed to compute the derivatives for piecewise functions using that concept of weak derivatives. But then actually, if we only have weak differentiability, it's not really legal to check a condition like this in a pointwise way. So you're not really allowed to simply check if minus Laplacian of u at the point x and y is equal to x, uh, f of x and y for all uh, points x and y in omega because it's only defined, because the, the function was only defined uh, piecewise. And so, um, well, the weak derivative is defined in an integral sense. So that is not actually doable because imagine simply if you have um, a piecewise function, then how would you define the gradient on the edge of a cell? Because in the one direction you have one linear function, in the other direction you have the other linear function, so the gradient is simply not well defined. And even though we have said that this is fine in an integral sense, because the edge has measured zero, it is not fine in a pointwise sense. So this concept of weak derivatives is not perfectly suited for this strong form. So our idea is, well, if we have weak derivatives and they don't match the strong form, then let's create a weak form. And that will be a reformulation of the problem in the context of Sobolev spaces. So the goal is to find a problem that is, of course, related. I mean, we can't just change everything about the problem and uh, the solution has nothing to do with the original one anymore. So we want to find a related problem that is defined for functions that are once weakly differentiable instead of twice classically differentiable. Okay, let's, let's look at this a uh, bit more in detail. Um, well, twice classically differentiable is obvious probably because in the classical strong form we have minus Laplacian of u at a certain point x and y, let's say. So we need a function that is classically differentiable twice in order to make this Laplacian pointwise well defined. Now we want to talk about weak, uh, weak derivatives now because it's a piecewise function. And we also want to talk about only once weakly differentiable functions because we have seen in the example of the piecewise linear thing that if we form second derivatives, even if they are weak second derivatives, it's still the constant zero. So we want to reformulate the whole problem such that we go from um, classical derivatives to weak derivatives and from twice uh, or from yeah two derivations to one. Okay, so there is two parts where we want to change something. And now let's go through this process together. This is the strong form, so the classical problem that we started at. And we assume that we have a function u, which is c2, so twice classically differentiable, and a solution of this problem. Okay, So we are going, um, in a sense, it will follow the same structure that we used when defining weak derivatives. There we also did this approach of saying, okay, let's assume that we have a classical derivative, then we can apply the partial integration stuff and it all works out. And then, well, if now the other way in order to define the weak derivatives, we assume that something like a partial integration statement holds, then we can call G the weak derivative. And we're doing that same thing here again. So, we assume that we have a classical solution, 
we reformulate the problem in a certain way and then we have a related problem that is somewhat different. Okay, let's start here. We have a classical C2 solution of this problem. And we take an arbitrary test function, so we already have introduced this space of test functions, so this CC infinity, so infinitely many times differentiable with a compact support inside of omega. That meant that in the 1D example, for, um, for example here, if you have an interval AB, then a CC infinity function will be smooth everywhere, infinitely strongly smooth, and then you would have a support, so that part where the function is non-zero, inside of the domain omega. So a test function will always look something like this. So you have your open set omega, and the support of the function is a compact set inside of your open omega. Okay, and then you multiply the PDE with it, and you get to this equation number two. And obviously, if u was a solution of one, then this is definitely true, because it simply results from multiplying the PDE with the test function. Then if the original thing was true for, uh, yeah, then it's definitely true for every test function. Okay. And now let's go one step further. After having multiplied with a test function, we integrate that whole thing over the domain omega. And same argument as before. Well, if this thing here was true for every test function, then we can definitely integrate over this thing and it's still true, right? If you integrate over two equal functions, the integral will also be the same. And thus, by transitivity, you can also go from 1 to 3. So if u is a solution of this problem, then you can write this form number 2 here for every test function, and then you can integrate over the domain, and it's still a true statement. Now let's go further. Now here it comes, becomes interesting, because now we take that integrated statement and for this left side integral here we apply the Gaussian theorem. So this multi-dimensional version of partial integration. And what did that do? Well, it uh, reduces the number of derivatives on one function and it increases the number of derivatives on the other, which is why our Laplacian of u becomes a gradient, so from second derivative to first, and the psi becomes a gradient, so from zero derivatives to one. Also the sign is inverting, so from the minus here we have a plus here, and then you have this additional boundary integral part, and that is something I have already mentioned last week. Um, if you are in multiple space dimensions, it's not just evaluating the function at the boundary, but it's actually doing a boundary integral. And, well, this boundary integral is over the normal part of the derivative of u times the test function psi. And on the right-hand side of the integral, we haven't changed anything. And again, by transitivity of those conditions, because we have only reformulated them, if u is a solution to this problem number one, then this thing down here is true for every test function psi. And now we want to go even further. Having applied Gauss's theorem, we look a little more closely at this boundary integral and we think about the way that we have defined our psi. This was in C, C infinity of omega. And what's important here now is this C down here, because as the image that I've drawn before, you have your domain omega, which is open, then the support of psi is inside of the domain of omega, which in particular means that psi is definitely 
the constant zero on the domain of omega. So if I integrate something times psi over the, uh, the boundary of omega, then this whole integral will definitely vanish. And then you can see here that you arrive at this integral equation. And again, if u is a solution of the original strong form, then integral over gradient of u times gradient of psi is equal to the integral over f times psi. Okay, this is almost our weak formulation. And now we have this duality that I have initially spoken about. If u is a classical solution of the strong form, so u is a C2 function, twice classically differentiable, such that it solves the original PDE, then this is definitely true for all psi. That's what we have just derived. <clears throat> but for this expression here, to be well defined, we don't need a function that is twice classically differentiable because the highest derivative that occurs is a gradient of u. And you don't even need a pointwise gradient because it doesn't give a pointwise equation. Actually, gradient of u integrable or square integrable would com be completely sufficient for this to be well defined. So instead of uh, requiring u to be a C2 function, we can lower these requirements to u being in H1. And if u is in H1, this is already well defined. <coughs> okay, that is the same thing as we did with the weak derivatives. There we also said, well, if g times psi equals f times psi prime or minus, um, then this must mean that g is something like a derivative of f. And that same thing is true here. We don't need a C2 function u to make this well defined. It's sufficient to have u in h1. And then this would be something like a solution to the original problem. Just like g was something like a derivative of f. And some further uh, modifications are necessary here, or not necessary, but we do them. Um, the space of test functions has very high requirements, of course. They have to be c infinity, so infinitely many times differentiable, with a compact support inside of omega. Um, I think it's pretty obvious that C infinity C is subset of H10. Because, well, what does H10 mean? This means we have one weak derivative and zero on the boundary. We have already seen many times that those uh, um, functions with a compact support are zero on the boundary and if something is infinitely many times classically differentiable then it will definitely be once weakly differentiable okay so cc infinity is a subset of h10 so if we require this thing here to be true for all v in h10 instead of just psi in cc infinity then we are actually using a larger set for testing, right? So we uh, take more functions where we require this to be true. So that's something we can legally do. So we're not restricting anything. We are actually making the space of test functions bigger. And because we have originally started with a problem that contained boundary conditions, which we have completely ignored until now, we choose u in h10 and not in h1. So here we have h10 instead of the h1, although h1 is the um, 
part that is required for the thing to be well defined. We additionally include the zero boundary conditions because they were in the problem that we want to approximate. Okay, and now let's look what we have here. We have now derived the weak form of Poisson's equation. Find a function u in h10 such that this e integral equality gradient of u times gradient of v in the integral equals an integral over f times v is true for all v in h10. Okay, that all sounds nice, but what does it, how does it help us? Well, some remarks. Firstly, um, in this case, it's crucial to note the function spaces correctly. Okay, so it's important that u in this case is supposed to be in h10 and not just in h1 because they incorporate the boundary conditions. So if I write this thing here, and would instead write u in h1, then, um, well, we would have never spoken about uh, the boundary conditions anywhere. If you have the strong form minus Laplacian of u equals f and u equals zero um, in omega and on delta omega, then you have noted the boundary conditions individually here. So it would almost always be implicitly clear that you should be at least in C2 to make this well defined. But here in the, in the weak form, you need the H10 in order to know what the boundary conditions are. And now the next remark is the interesting one. Um, a solution to this weak form is in general not a solution for the strong form which is obvious because it is a completely different problem. So if u solves this thing here, then it doesn't necessarily solve this one up there. That's obvious for a start because it's not even well-defined. So you cannot just uh, plug an h1 or h10 function into this strong form because that was the original motivation. We can't form the point-wise Laplacian for, um, for a piecewise, uh, for a, an H1 function. Um, the opposite, of course, is true. So if you have a solution for the strong form, then it also solves the weak form. That is how we derived it, right? So the derivation was that if you have a strong form solution, then you can do all those uh, modifications by multiplying with the test function, integrating over the domain, applying Gaussian theorem. And these are all equivalent reformulations. So if you have a strong form, it's also a weak form, but a weak form or a weak solution is not necessarily a solution to the strong problem. And that's also a huge similarity to those weak derivatives. We've also seen that if you have a strong or a classical derivative, this is also the weak derivative, but functions that have a weak derivative not necessarily are differentiable in a classical sense. Of course, it's important and interesting to discuss the differences or the relations between the strong and weak solutions. Uh, we will talk about this later on in the semester, but for now you can just assume that Solving the weak problem is a good approximation to solving the strong problem. So the solutions, I mean, it's not completely obvious, but the solutions to the weak and the strong form are very, uh, very similar. So they are closely related. And in that sense, we can say, if we do the weak formulation or if we solve the weak formulation which has lower requirements right u has to be only h10 instead of uh, c2 then we can kind of consider u to be an approximation to the solution for the original strong form and that can be in your minds the yeah well the term that you imagine when talking about weak solutions so a good approximation to the strong solution.
Okay, um, quick recap and outlook. Uh, what have we done so far? Okay, in the uh, discussions in the last lectures, we have um, defined a discretization of the domain using a grid that contained points and cells, those two arrays. And we also have derived, and that was just now, a problem statement involving weak derivatives up to order 1, which is perfectly well suited for piecewise linear functions, because if you have piecewise linear functions, then the, um, the weak gradient is piecewise constant, but it is not zero, right? Um, so yeah, in the last lecture we have uh, derived this concept of weak derivatives and Sobolev spaces, and today we have used this to define the weak formulation, well suited for piecewise polynomial functions, but also from a theoretical point of view has uh, lower requirements for the solution, so we don't need C2 functions anymore. What we haven't done so far is discretizations on those function spaces, so we have just derived a formulation uh, in terms of H10, right? So if you look at this again, um, it was H10 as the function space, and although this is a weaker form and it's not C2, this is still definitely an infinite dimensional space. So still problematic on a computer. So we haven't done any discretizations on the uh, function spaces and in particular we haven't derived our piecewise polynomial spaces. Also we haven't talked about efficient ways of computing integrals numerically because in contrast to the strong form, where we simply have this equality minus Laplacian of u equals f pointwise, we now have integrals everywhere. So the de definition of the weak derivatives requires integrals. This uh, equation in the weak form itself is an integral equation. So we definitely need a way to do that. That will also be a topic. But for now, um, we deal with the function spaces. And the first step to doing this is to talking about uh, is talking about local function spaces on our reference cell. Now, after some part of the audience may think that I've uh, only made things more complicated in the last lecture and the first half of this lecture today, um, I will try to actually make things more simple now. So now will be the start of defining our discrete uh, function spaces, in particular the local polynomial spaces. And to do this, uh, we want to look at the setting first. So we have started by defining a grid on the domain. So this set tau h containing a set of um, triangles. Of course, it shouldn't be only three. It should be some more. That's a typo here. Um, so tau h from yeah a number of triangles and then uh, we will in the end um, construct piecewise functions so in general piecewise polynomial functions but for now you can just always think about piecewise linear functions so those are functions defined on the whole domain omega and if you restrict them to one particular triangle T, so that's what this operator means, so this restriction of V to one particular cell, then it's a polynomial on this cell. So more precisely in this case, a linear polynomial. And that's supposed to be true for all triangles or all cells. So you have a function that is globally defined, but on each cell, it's an actual polynomial. So that's why those piecewise polynomials aren't real polynomials, right? But on every cell, it's an actual polynomial. So they are defined globally and the restriction to any cell is linear. And that's why at this point I already want to um, encourage you to always be careful about the terms local and global. I will also be uh, very precise about them because it's important in finite elements to always be sure if you're talking about local things or global things because the same quantities usually exist uh, 
in both ways. You usually have local basis functions and global basis functions. You have local degrees of freedom and global degrees of freedom. So those small words, local and global, they are quite important. And while this uh, space of piecewise linear functions will be our global discrete function space, we are now trying to construct the local polynomial space, which is this P1 on a certain cell. And just to be a little, uh, yeah, just to help you a little with the visualization, what a piecewise function looks like, um, you see here probably the most uh, simple way of defining a grid by simply just defining two triangular cells. And below this, I have uh, depicted a piecewise linear function on this grid. So you see that this function on each of the two grid cells is linear, which is easily visible as it is a plane. And globally, of course, it's not a linear function because globally it's bent on this edge here. And this edge is precisely this edge um, between the two triangle cells. So a global function that in the restriction to each cell is a uh, linear function. So you could also say it's a connection of um, a set of linear functions or polynomial functions. So the general approach to get this um, space of piecewise functions is to start by defining the local polynomial basis for every cell that will be the contents of the lecture today and then connect those local functions to form a global basis that will be the next step in the next lecture so today the polynomial basis locally that's precisely p1 on t okay and that global basis that belongs to VH. Okay, so this space VH or piecewise functions is the global function space and for that we will later on define a global basis and the local space is the space of polynomials, not piecewise, actual polynomials on a certain cell and that has a local basis of course and we will define that one today. And for that, a short reminder, we have uh, a few lectures ago spoken about grids and reference transformation. And there we have seen that for any, um, let's just stick with triangles for now. So for any triangle in our grid with uh, vertex um, coordinates A0, A1 and A2, uh, we can define this so-called reference map that maps our uh, reference cell T hat so this very simple triangle with vertices 0, 0, 1, 0 and 0, 1 onto this particular grid cell. And we have also seen that if we have a function that is defined here, then we can transform the function to T using this uh, reference map. If we have, um, we, I think we called it phi in the lecture already, if we have um, gradients of this function phi, then we can also transform the gradients to this cell. So what that means is that we will restrict all considerations from here on out when talking about local basis functions or local polynomial spaces. We will restrict everything to the reference cell T hat because it is completely sufficient to define everything there and then define it to an actual grid cell because we've seen in the lecture that this definition of FT was very simple. It only involved the vertex coordinates of A0, A1 and A2 and we could also easily form the Jacobian and invert this and so on. So we will do everything from now on only on T hat and in the talk about reference transformations, I have already motivated that this makes things a lot easier. So 
instead of trying to define the space P1 of T for some weirdly shaped uh, triangle T, we will always go for the space P1 of T hat. So the space of linear polynomials on this simple reference triangle. And you can see already here that this is probably going to be a not very problematic task because we want to talk about linear polynomials, so the easiest thing you can imagine, on a very simple reference triangle. So it, it's not possible to define more simple functions on a more simple geometry. And that's why we're going to do it exactly this way because we only want to make it as complicated as necessary. First off, uh, to talk about basis representations, I want to summarize the setting. Um, T hat is the reference triangle and the space PK of T hat is a general space of polynomials of degree K on T hat. Usually we want to talk about linear polynomials, so P1 of T hat, but we will later on in the lecture also give an outlook on quadratic or higher order polynomials. Um, so in general, it can be all defined in the same way, PK of T hat. Observations. And that's very important here, because why do we want to go from those uh, infinite dimensional spaces, H10 and so on, to piecewise polynomial spaces and then locally to actual polynomial spaces? The reason is that polynomial spaces always have finite dimension. So no matter what K is and no matter what the dimension of our underlying world is, so 2D in our usual applications, but 3D is also possible, it's always a finite dimensional space. And when doing applications on a computer, that is a crucial thing because finite dimensional stuff can be done on a computer. Infinite dimensional stuff is simply not doable. So PK of T hat has finite dimension no matter what K is. In the most common example that we're talking about, so the uh, space of P1, so the linear polynomials on T hat, the dimension is precisely 3. And, well, in, when talking about quadratic polynomials, we have a different value there, but um, for now you can always think about linear polynomials and then that space dimension is exactly 3. Um, in order to yeah, visualize um, what that means, well, if you have a linear function then what does a linear function in, uh, in 2D look like? Well, that's a constant part plus something times x plus something else times y, right? That's what a linear function looks like in 2D. So you have essentially three coefficients that you can choose when defining your function. And that's exactly the... Um, the reason why this dimension is 3. And now if you have a quadratic function, um, let's call it phi linear and phi quadratic, then you have also a constant part plus a linear part with respect to x, a linear part with respect to y, but then again you also have something with x times y, then you have something with x square, and you have something with y square. And that's why the quadratic space has one, two, three, four, five, six as the dimension. Okay? But now here you can always think about this linear case. Okay, next thing. If we have a finite dimensional space, then we can define a basis. Okay, basis is something that you know from linear algebra when talking about vector spaces, for example. So you have probably learned that for a space, for example, R3, you can define a basis. And this basis had to be, um, well, a set of linearly independent vectors such that they span the whole space. 
So for example, in R3, the standard bases are those uh, three vectors where you each have a one in a different component. That's one example. And we want to do that same thing here because those polynomial spaces are also finite dimensional spaces, just like R3. And the number of basis functions is precisely the dimension of the space. Um, so if we start our indexing at zero, because that's what is usually done in computational uh, applications, then we have phi zero up until phi nb minus one. So when talking about or when, when writing this letter phi, this is always referring to basis functions. Okay, the letter phi is always reserved to basis functions and the phi hat is precisely a basis function on the reference cell t hat. Okay, um, well, okay, we can define a basis and then if you have a basis, then you can write every element as a linear combination of the basis. And what I did earlier, uh, when I tried to motivate why the linear space has um, dimension 3, I wrote that uh, my element, or I call it p hat in this case, can be written like a0 plus a1 times x plus uh, alpha 2 times y. Um, there I have implicitly used the basis, and that basis would be the function 1, the function x, and the function y. Okay? And if you have now those any type of basis, then you can write every element of the space as a linear combination of those three or of those basis functions. So if your phi hats are the basis functions, then you can add some gammas and then linearly combine them. And that sum should only go to nb minus 1, because that's the number of basis functions here, or the, the, the last index for the basis functions. Um, and then you can write your element as a linear combination of the basis functions, just like I originally did when I tried to find out the dimension. But now here comes the problem. As you already know from the considerations in linear algebra when talking about R3, for example, a basis is not unique. There exists for every space that has a basis or where a basis can be defined, there exists infinitely many ways to define a basis. Because, well, there exist infinitely many ways to find linearly independent vectors that span the whole space. Okay, but that's kind of problematic because if you have infinitely many ways to define something that's always problematic in terms of computers because as I've already um, stated many times in this lecture, infinite infinity is problematic on a machine. So what do we do? Well, we want to fix some condition such that we get uniqueness because if you have infinitely much of something, sometimes it's a good thing to fix an additional property or an additional requirement and then you get your uniqueness. And our key to uniqueness is to define a specific set of local degrees of freedom. Here again, this word local is important. So we will later on be talking about global degrees of freedom in the next lecture precisely. But now this is local degrees of freedom because they only refer to the individual cells or more precisely in this case the reference cell. And what does degree of freedom mean in this case? Well, we simply fix certain points on our triangle that are of special importance. And of course we do this in the most simple way that we can imagine, because we always want to keep things as simple as possible. So for um, the space P1, which has dimension three, we want to fix three degrees of freedom, that's something intuitive, so you always have as many degrees of freedom as you have a dimension. So for the space P1 on T hat with dimension 3, we simply say that our degrees of freedom, so those points where we are interested in, 
are the vertices of the triangle. And then if you are on P2, which has dimension 6, you take those three vertices and you add the centers of all edges. Okay, if you talk about P3, then the dimension changes and you would have to change different degrees of freedom. But what's common to all of them is that you specify certain points in your reference cell that are simple and interesting. And of course, well, if you would, well, if I would ask you to name certain or three important points of a triangle, then it would probably be the vertices. So we start with the most intuitive choice that you can imagine. And now, if you have those degrees of freedom, then you still don't have a, a unique basis, but it's possible to define one by requiring the additional Lagrangian condition. So we want to define a basis that is a basis to the space, but it also fulfills the Lagrangian condition um, with respect to those degrees of freedom that we have defined. And although this Lagrangian condition sometimes looks a bit uh, cryptic when writing it mathematically, it's actually pretty simple. So you want every basis function to have the value 1 at precisely one degree of freedom and the value 0 at all other degrees of freedom. So if I look at this P1 example up here, then I would have a basis function that has the value 1 here, the value 0 here and the value 0 here. And then the next thing I could define is another basis function that has the value 1 here, 0 here and 0 here. Okay? And if you talk about that P2 example, then you would have, for example, a basis function with the value 1 here and 0 at all other 5 degrees of freedom. And that's what this Lagrangian condition means. So you have a value 1 only if the um, index m is equal to the index of the degree of freedom. That also means that you have a clear correspondence. So you can always say that a basis function corresponds to a particular degree of freedom, so to that one where it has the value 1. Okay, So the basis function corresponding with this point here is the basis function that has value 1 here and 0 at all others. And well, why do we do this? We will see that now. Um, firstly, if we fix this additional condition, we have a uniqueness for the basis. It's easy, actually, it's pretty easy to prove that, but I'm not going to do this now. So as soon as you fix this uh, Lagrangian condition, your basis gets unique. And okay, now that's something good, because unique is now something the computer can handle. But you might still ask why we define this particular condition instead of some other condition. I mean, I could also require something to be, uh, I don't know, 10 at all points of the grid or something. Um, uh, the, the reason is that if you define your basis using this Lagrangian condition, the abstract coefficients in the linear combination actually have a meaning. So we said here in this uh, introductory part that every element of the space can be written as a linear combination of the basis functions. And while, for example, in this definition that I wrote down here with the basis 1, x and y, those coefficients have <coughs> not such a strong meaning, we actually have a practical meaning to the coefficients if we use our Lagrangian basis. And why is that? Well, if you imagine that this Lagrangian condition is true and you say that um, my p hat can be written as a linear combination of those basis functions using certain coefficients um, gamma m and you want to know what this gamma m actually means and yeah 
let's see what happens if you evaluate the function p at a certain degree of freedom. So now let's let's take an, some type of fun or some uh, function of the space and evaluate it at this point. Well, then this is this sum, and you see that the Lagrangian condition tells you that. Uh, the basis function evaluated at a certain degree of freedom is this chronicle delta thing. So one if the uh, indices are the same and zero otherwise, which means that from this whole sum, you're only left with the uh, with gamma n, because for all other m's, you have value zero in the chronicle delta here, and only for m and n equal, you get the number 1, meaning that gamma n, so this abstract coefficient in the linear combination, is actually the value of the function p at the degree of freedom. And that's of course pretty helpful, because if you want to define your, if you want to find out what your coefficients are, you can simply evaluate the function at the degree of freedom and then you have your, um, your coefficient. So in order to compute gamma 0, gamma 1 and gamma 2 in this uh, linear case, you simply take your function, evaluate it at this point, that gives you gamma 0. Then you evaluate it here and that gives you gamma 1 and this up here gives you gamma 2. Okay, so by defining this Lagrangian condition, and um, reflecting from this condition, we call this a Lagrangian basis, because it is a basis for the space that fulfills the Lagrangian condition. Um, that way we can give a practically useful meaning to those otherwise abstract mathematical um, coefficients. And that's very helpful. That's also a concept we will use later on when we define our global basis. So for the global basis functions, we will also choose our degrees of freedom such that the coefficients in the linear combination in the end have the meaning of values at certain points. Okay, now that we have chosen our um, degrees of freedom and defined the Lagrangian condition, it's time to actually look at the basis functions. And we start with a linear basis function and in particular the linear basis function corresponding with this point down here. So we want to define a function that has value 1 at this point 0, 0 and value 0 at, here it's supposed to be 1 and here it's supposed to be 0 and here it's supposed to be 0. And well, if you look at this function phi 0, phi hat 0 that I've written down here, 1 minus x hat minus y hat, and you do the check, then you observe that this is precisely the case. So if you plug in 0 and 0, then this is 1 minus 0 minus 0, which is 1. And if you plug in one of the other two points, then this gives you 0 as a result. Okay, so this simple function phi 0 fulfills all of our requirements. And then, of course, this is only one basis function, so you have another one for the point down here. And a third one for the point up here. And for that you can do it quite similarly. So, uh, for the point in the bottom right corner, it's uh, the function x hat. And then if you plug in, well, either this point or this point up here, then you see that you get zero because the x component of those points is zero. And if you plug in the point in the bottom right, that gives you the number one. And that same can be done for the other basis function, and that is simply y hat. And there you can also see that it does exactly what you need. Okay, um, let's summarize this part. So this basis containing the functions uh, phi 0 equal to 1 minus x minus y, phi 1 equal to x and phi 2 equal to y. That is a basis, so let's, let's write this down, so this is a 
basis for P1 of T hat. And you can see here why I said earlier that it doesn't get much easier than defining linear functions on this simple triangle because this basis is as simple as it gets. Okay, this is a basis and this fulfills the Lagrangian condition with respect um, to the vertices of uh, the triangle. So Lagrangian with respect to 0, 0, 1, 0 and 0, 1. Okay. And that is already sufficient to define a local finite element basis. And that's quite cool, actually. So you don't need to think about or you don't, you don't have to analytically compute more complicated basis functions in order to define your finite element method. Okay, next step, quadratic basis. And in the quadratic basis, you have already seen that we are adding those edge centers. So those points have the coordinates 1 half, 0, 1 half, 1 half, and then 0, 1 half. And then we want to again compute basis functions. And they are supposed to uh, fulfill the Lagrangian conditions. But now, of course, if I have my basis function that corresponds with this point here, it is supposed to be again 1 here. But now it's not only 0 at those two points but it's zero at all those points here, okay? And that's of course something a linear function couldn't do, but it's something a quadratic function can do. So you have the condition that it is supposed to be one at this point down here and zero at the other points. And this, um, yeah, this definition here that you see, um, if you look at this precisely, then you see that this kind of contains the linear basis function that we have defined before. So this here is the linear function corresponding with the um, vertex or that I'm talking about. And this again here is the linear function corresponding with the vertex I'm talking about. And we will later on uh, see how this, um, why this is the case. Now let's just assume we define this function and then we can do all those checks. Okay, plug in your point 0, 0. Well, then this point up here becomes 1. This point in here is also 1 and then it's 2 times 1 minus 1. So that's 1 again and you in the end get 1. If you plug in uh, one of those vertex points, then you have a 0 as a factor up front here because in this case and in this case this is 0. And if you plug in one of those points where you have one half, um, you definitely also get zero. For, so in the first case, this one here is zero. And in the second case, you have one minus one half. So it's one half. And then two times one half is one again. And then one minus one is zero. And that's true for those two. So those this function vanishes at those other points. Okay, of course this is not a linear function anymore because we are multiplying two linear functions and that gives you something quadratic. All right, and then in an analogous way we can define the basis functions corresponding with the other two vertices. And they are again constructed by, in the same scheme, using the linear function. So here again you have the linear function x hat, that was the basis function corresponding with the bottom right corner. And you have the basis function y hat corresponding with this uh, top corner here. And they again define your basis function. And of course you can do the same checking that I did, but I'm not doing this at this moment here but that's pretty easy to verify that they actually fulfill the Lagrangian conditions. Okay, now we've seen how we can define the first three basis functions of the quadratic basis, so those corresponding with the uh, vertices. Now we have to look at the basis functions corresponding with the edge centers, and there I'm directly giving the uh, full thing. 
So let's start looking at the basis function corresponding with this point one half one half here. And if you define your basis function to be 4 times x times y, then you can check those conditions. Okay, if you plug in, if you have a zero in any component, then it definitely gives you zero. If you put in one half for x and y, then it is 4 times 1 half times 1 half, so it's 4 times 1 half is 2, and then times 1 half is 1. That's why this 4 comes here. It has to be some kind of normalization factor for this case, such that we get actually the value 1. And then again, if you have a 0 here as x and a 0 here as y, then you get the zeros again. And, well, this again is... Um, somehow containing the uh, linear basis functions. So if you um, are at this point, then the basis function is formed as 4, the normalization factor, times the basis functions corresponding with the two points that are adjacent to the edge, right? We had the the basis function x hat for this point down here and the basis function y hat for this point up here. And so I'm taking 4 times x hat times y hat. And that same uh, scheme can be also applied for the other um, two edge centers. So if I'm taking my edge center 0 and 1 half, this one here, then the adjacent basis functions are y hat for the top vertex and 1 minus x hat minus y hat for the bottom left corner. And I'm also again doing that same thing. So I'm multiplying the y hat with the 1 minus x hat minus y hat. And that same also for the last one. Okay, then you can of course do the verification that this again works. Um, but we are going to skip this part here. Okay, now summary about the quadratic basis functions. You have um, essentially two different types of degrees of freedom, vertices and edge centers. And you also have two different types of basis functions. The first one is corresponding by um, directly combining the basis functions corresponding with the vertex from 1D. So like basis functions times 2 basis function minus 1. And the other ones are formed by multiplying the uh, basis functions from 1D, uh, from, from the linear case, that correspond with the two vertices adjacent to the edge, and then multiplying with a factor 4. So it's again those simple basis functions from the linear case, just in a recombination. And then those six things here give you your quadratic basis on uh, the reference cell. Short outlook, higher order polynomials. Um, well, you have already seen when we derived the, uh, the quadratic basis that it is not super obvious. So it's easy to verify that a certain thing works, but it's probably not something that you could write down super easily. And the reason is that Cartesian coordinates are, in a sense, rectangular coordinates. So everything in our coordinate systems is rectangular. And that doesn't really match the shape of the triangle, because you have, in your 2D coordinate system, you have two axes, the x-axis, and the y-axis, so they follow the two edges of your uh, triangle perfectly. But then there is this other edge which is, which is completely left alone in the middle. So Cartesian coordinates are perfect for rectangles, but they are not a good match for triangles. And that's why when you want to define uh, higher order polynomials, or in general want to derive the basis functions, so that's also where those quadratic basis functions stem from, uh, you introduce a new coordinate system. 
you introduce a coordinate system that is specifically intended to be used with triangles. And these are called the barycentric coordinates, because a barycenter is the point in the middle, so the center of mass of your triangle. And this has three axes now. And you see that each one of those axes con com uh, connects a vertex with an edge center. Okay, vertex, edge center, and so on. And now this has three base functions, which is a perfect match. Uh, no, it has three axes, which perfectly matches the three edges of your triangle. And then you could also see that, uh, yeah, those coordinate or those degrees of freedoms that we have used for the basis function definitions, they have super intuitive uh, coordinates with respect to this basis. And yeah, so that's that's a good way to go if you want to define higher order polynomials because with this uh, coordinate system it's actually much easier compared to talking about Cartesian coordinates. I'm going to skip this part in the lecture because it will not be relevant for the implementation parts in the future. So in the implementation we will focus on the linear uh, polynomials only and for them to be defined it's not really necessary to go this way. Um, but still, it's an interesting concept, and that's why I've added a uh, PDF document in the description of this video, giving you a motivation on how and why this barycentric coordinate system is defined, and how it can be used to, for example, derive the quadratic polynomials. Because I think the quadratic uh, basis is already something where it's not completely intuitive where I have derived it from. And that is explained in this document, and there is also an outlook, um, yeah, how you could do this for higher orders. So if you're interested in the details behind the uh, definition of those basis functions, please take a look at this uh, document. And otherwise, for the implementation, you can simply use those functions that I have derived for P1 and P2 in this lecture. Okay, um, that was everything you need to know about local polynomial spaces. So this lecture ends with the definition of the local polynomial spaces. And the next thing we want to do is take those local polynomial spaces and define them to get our global piecewise polynomial space. So stay tuned for the next lecture and I'm looking forward to hearing and seeing all of you again.